We take a short break from practical applications in image processing and turn to discuss a fundamental topic, estimation theory applied to sparse length signals. I would like to motivate this discussion by showing you something really strange. This is the P0 epsilon problem, which you have seen already so many times. Until now, we struggled to approximate its solution, and now we'll do something different. Suppose that somehow we could find a set of J candidate solutions all being feasible, that is, they obey the epsilon constraint. Also, all of them are rather sparse, with much less non zeros than the dimension of the signal Z. Then here are a few intriguing questions. What could we do with such a set of solutions? If anything beneficial could be done with them, why would this be possible? And above all these, how could we get such a set of results? As it turns out, a series of papers in the past decade studied these questions and the theory they lead to. And now we will bring you in on this magnificent secret. You might wonder why we are bothering with this bizarre idea. What if two sparse solutions could be proposed for the same signal Z? Well, each of these solutions has a different story to tell us, and perhaps this could be leveraged to denoise Z better. Maybe this could serve as some sort of protection from the tendency of pursuit algorithms to make mistakes? And then again, maybe there are deeper reasons for all of this? Let's return to the technical question of getting the set of sparse solutions. Here is an idea based on the OMP. All we will do is to randomize one of its stages, and with this we will get the desired diversified solutions. Here is the OMP algorithm, and we will not describe all its steps as we have already done that. In the main iteration, on step 2, we take the inner product of the residual with all the atoms and choose the maximal value to point to the atom that joins the support. Now let's do things a little bit differently, and randomly choose the next atom to join the support. The probability we assign to each atom is directly proportional to the exponent of these inner products. This way, the maximal value has higher chances of being selected, but there is a chance for others to be chosen just as well. There is a parameter C in setting these probabilities. Let's assume for now that it is set manually somehow. We call this algorithm the random OMP. Of course, we will have to run it J times to get J candidate solutions. And now let's experiment with it. We start by creating a random dictionary of size 100 by 200. We multiply it by a sparse vector alpha 0 of cardinality 10, add noise and get the signal Z. Then, in an attempt to denoise Z, we run the OMP to approximate the solution of P0 epsilon, and we also run the random OMP 1000 times, getting 1000 possible alternative solutions. Let's have a look at the solutions we got. How sparse are the solutions the random OMP provided. This graph shows the histogram of their cardinalities. The number of non-zeros ranges from 2 all the way to 20, and indeed all are relatively sparse when compared to the signal dimension 100. By the way, the OMP gave the sparsest solution with two non-zeros. What about the epsilon constraint? As you can see, all solutions obey the constraint and give a squared error below 100. Now let's talk about denoising performance. Each and every one of these solutions is a denoiser. All that we should do is to multiply it by D, and this is a candidate cleaned version of Z. This graph shows the noise attenuation factor, which is the ratio between the level of noise in the result and its level in the signal Z. D times alpha zero is the true signal. The smaller this ratio, the better the denoising effect. Observe that OMP gave a ratio of 0.17, which is not bad at all, but many of the alternative solutions got a better ratio, even 0.1. You might be wondering, who of these solutions performs better? Are these the sparser solutions? This graph shows the denoising factor as a function of the cardinality. We see that the good denoiser are spread all over the range of cardinalities. These are somewhat surprising results, don't you think? And now, here is something that will really blow your minds. We will take all the 1000 solutions that the random OMP gave us and simply average them, getting alpha hat. In this graph you see in blue the true non-zeros, 10 of them, the OMP solution having only two non-zeros, and the alpha hat in black, 
This representation is not sparse at all. In fact, it is dense. All its entries are non-zeros. Nevertheless, when we use it as our denoiser, we get a denoising ratio of 0.052, far better than all the alternative solutions we have seen. What is going on here? Could it be that all this is an artifact of our specific experiment? We repeat this experiment 1,000 times, each time with a different and random initial sparse vector alpha zero. All the rest of the parameters remain the same, such as the size of the dictionary, the number of runs of the random OMP, the base cardinality, and so on. And now we present the results as 1,000 points, horizontally putting the OMP denoising ratio, and vertically the random OMP one with the averaging. The average of all these points shows a nearly factor of two improvement in the denoising for the random OMP. Have you noticed that there is a group of points giving the very same performance for both approaches? These are the cases in which the created signal Z has energy below epsilon and then all the solutions we produce are plain zeros. So what is going on here? I hope you already made the connection between the strange behavior we experience here and the one we saw in earlier experiments in which dense representations suggested themselves as good solutions for our sparseland problems. We will now move to a clear explanation of this phenomenon.